please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back. Reliance has reclaimed the top spot on the Nifty in terms of a weightage. Uh, so now it's the top weighted stock in the Nifty for the first time since 2012, overtaking TCS. Nigel has done some data crunching and he's here with the analysis. Nigel? Well, that's right. Reliance Industries is back. It's the boss of the index of the Nifty, uh, you know, in today's uh, trading session. It's a top weighted stock. And in fact, for the first time in more than half a decade, that Reliance Industries is back up there. If you look at it, well, Reliance Industries intraday, it mildly overtook HDFC Bank. And HDFC Bank, remember, has been the one that's been holding pole position for a lot of the last uh, few months odd. Well, in the last few years, you know, Reliance Industries had stepped back. And the ones that really overtook the leadership were ITC, Infosys, ICICI Bank, as well as HDFC Bank. At some point of time, all of them said, well, we are the boss of uh, the index. But if you look at the way the weightage has moved, you know, back then in 2012, it was the highest weight in Jan 2012, in fact, 8.7%. Then it seemed to have lost its way. The weightage fell down all the way to around 5%. And then, in fact, you know, in the last one year, the weightage increase on the index has moved from around 6% to around 9.5%. So the weight on the index of Reliance Industries has moved up by nearly around 50%. I remember a decade ago, at that point of time, the total weightage on the index was calculated as per market capitalization. Now, in fact, it's on free float market capitalization. So at that point of time, Reliance Industries even had 12 to around 13% in terms of the weightage. And now, in fact, it's at around 9.45%. But the mode of computation really had changed. In the last one year, though, the previous graph should come up for you. Well, Reliance Industries is up nearly around 50%. The index, as the Nifty, is up only around 17%. So it's been a massive outperformer. And importantly, in terms of total market capitalization that it has added is 2.8 lakh crores. That's only the addition in the last one year. There are a lot of companies out there and big names whose total market capitalization is less than 2.8 lakh crores. So you should pull up some of those names. You know, it, it, if you just want to put it simply, Reliance Industries market cap that it's added, it's added nearly one SBI, one Maruti Suzuki, one Kotak Mahindra Bank, and the list goes on as well. So after more than a decade, Reliance Industries is back. It's the boss of the Nifty, holding a weightage of around 9.45%. Absolutely, the big one. But let's... Uh... Uh, let's get the disclaimer up for you on your screen. Reliance Industries is the owner of uh, the channel that you're watching. Uh, moving on then to Kotak Mahindra Bank that continues to remain under pressure after Reserve Bank of India has dismissed the bank's plan to dilute its promoter stake. Abhishek joins in with the details. Uh, Abhishek, they tried to be very creative about it, but it looks like it's been dismissed by the RBI. Well, Rima, you have said it exactly. You know, the preference issue does not meet the uh, promoter holding criteria as per RBI. And that is why they have dismissed the plea that the preference issuance can be taken as part of, you know, the promoter holding. However, Kotra Bank has mentioned that they will appeal against this as they feel that this uh, preference issue does meet the uh, criteria of RBI in terms of uh, promoter holding. The bank had approved preference issuance of worth about 500 crores few weeks back. What does that impact on our, uh, Kotak is that the promoter will need to cut their stake to 20% versus 30% right now by December 2018. So they have the option of acquiring someone or issuing fresh equity or you know paring down their own stake that is Uday Kotak's own stake. So what that means is that there is about 24,000 to 25,000 crore worth amounts you know that can come in from fresh selling if at all the stake sale happens. According to our sources, RBI and Finance Ministry were against this move as it is not in the right spirit. They were also mentioned that this issuance can set a bad precedence to others to follow. Opposition were also from industry stalwarts and the move is seen unfair to those who have already met the criteria of RBI in reducing the promoter stake. We had reached out to the management of Kotak Bank uh, on Tuesday morning regarding this and this issuance has come in clarification in the evening back to you okay thanks so much uh, for that uh, abhishek well uh, you know we just spoke to sonata software and the stock is just on a one-way tear it's up nearly around 10 percent as we speak 
moving to the high point of the day I guess, in the last few minutes. Yeah. I guess the market wants new ideas on yeah. how to play these, you know, IT, IT companies stocks, yeah. given the currency tailwind. So I guess they're just latching on to where Anything, they hear yeah. positive commentary from the management. And as you said earlier, HCL Tech, you know, that's the rare one out there that's underperforming in today's uh, trading session. Also importantly, remember the record date for TCS is in yeah. the next couple of days. So, you know, retail audience out there, um, if you sell your shares today, make sure that those shares are deleted from your account. They should not be in your account uh, if you want to qualify under that 2 lakh category. You know, for example, if you bought 100 shares, the stock price today is 2010, right? So, uh, you won't come in the sub 2 lakh category. So, even if you sell it today, you need to make sure and inform your broker that those shares are not there. Those, you know, whatever is adjusted shares, if it's five shares or four shares or whatever it is, it's not there in your account on the on the record date. Otherwise, you will not qualify for the sub two lakh category. And then, in fact, your acceptance ratio will not be as high as the retail category as we have seen in the past. But the market's mildly lower. Ashwini Gujral and Rajat Bose are with us. Ashwini, what's the trade on the Nifty? And more importantly, the Nifty Bank is now down 100 points. Is it giving you a buying opportunity? It's down 75 and I think it is giving you a buying opportunity because each time the market has come off in the last couple of days, it has failed to make uh, you know fresh lows. So I think even now you can buy and probably bank of tea expiry is there. So private banks are likely to see uh, some sort of upside. But uh, my sense is that uh, given the number of sectors which are now participating, large stocks moving up, uh, I think Bank Nifty should close higher from here and the next uh, few days we should get past uh, 11,500. So that way, uh, still a good time to buy into Bank Nifty. Bata is a buy with a stop of uh, 990, target of 1,025. PNB is a buy with a stop of 80, target of 86. And uh, RBL Bank is a buy with a stop of 574, target of 590. Any mid-cap IT companies that you would recommend to trade on the upside, Ashwini? See, that trade was, I think, uh, on Friday, Thursday. But uh, still, I think NIT Tech, uh, Mindtree, uh, Tata Alexi, Sonata Software is just about breaking out. So all of these stocks can be taken up because uh, if the rupee continues to remain below 70, uh, there could be a bit more of a rally on these exporters. Okay, all right. And, uh, you know, Zensar as well, the volumes are not very high on that counter. But that stock as well is uh, running away. In fact, it's up more than 10% as we speak. Pull up the interday chart of Zensar as well. Stock is moving higher. Keep in mind, you have something like a Sumit Securities. That's a holding company of that stock. And that as well is moving higher. Very, very low volumes. Zensar particularly as well. I don't think the volumes are more than 20,000 on both the exchanges. So keep that in mind. But that stock as well. You know, there's actually quite a clear differentiation that the market is making between the companies which are delivering good numbers yeah. and ones which are not. Because right now, the companies which are in the red include eClerks, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, where the whole BPO model itself is getting disrupted on the back of automation. So eClerks has been reporting weak numbers for many quarters now. So that is down 2.5%. Wipro is not participating, where the organic growth is in very low single digits for the full year. Uh, and it's expected to be even for F519. So that is under pressure. HCL Technology. Um, you know, the numbers have been a bit subdued and lower compared to its peers like in Enforces and TCS. So HCL2 uh, is not participating on the downside, uh, is not participating. On the flip side, you've got companies like Mindtree, Scient, um, you know, which are reporting good numbers. They're the They're ones which rewarded. are getting rewarded yet again, day after day. So there is a clear differentiation and, you know, that the market is making. Okay, all right. Let's uh, get in some picks then. Uh, Rajat, what are the picks you have for us? Well, one of them is a software stock, Mindtree. I would put a stop loss below 1039 and target would be 1063 and 1070. By tomorrow, I expect these targets to be completed. Uh, and then Amara Raja, uh, that stock also has a lot of momentum. I would say put a stop loss below 849, buy it and target would be 873 and 879. Apart from that, those who have uh, Real risk-taking ability can actually think of buying into Jet Airways for stop loss below 289 and target would be 299 and 302. Jet Airways is actually uh, is on a recovery trail. Chances are that 289, uh, 298 to about 302 would be tested by that. 
Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in. Let's get the early rates up for you uh, from the European markets. Globally, uh, there has been a bit of a recovery. Yes, markets like Hang Seng continue to be in the red. Uh, that's down close to about 150, 200 points. Uh, but um, there is generally optimism that the US-China trade talks could take a positive tilt after a fresh, um, you know, after I think there was some talk about, you know, a possible meeting uh, between the commerce uh, ministers. So in the green right now, for the frontline European indices, a gain of close to about 0.3%. Get into a break. On the other side, we'll get you an excerpt from our exclusive conversation with Nitin Rakesh, the CEO and whole time director of emphasis on the growth outlook for the company. Welcome back. It's been almost two years since private equity giant Blackstone took over emphasis. Since then, the stock has doubled, the revenue trajectory has improved. I caught up with the CEO and whole time director of emphasis, Nitin Rakesh, and began by asking him if the company can continue to sustain double digit revenue growth going ahead. Listen in. We uh, started FIA 19 on a pretty strong footing. Uh, we talked about accelerating our uh, order book last year. We signed up more than you know 550 million in TCV. Some of that is playing out this year. So our Q1 you know exit uh, run rate is pretty strong. So we feel good about the fact that this year should be a good above market growth year for us. Uh, I think two of our core segments, uh, DXEHP and Direct Core, uh, continue to be at our above market growth, which uh, augurs really well for our uh, you know overall growth for FI19 and of course in 20. Okay, uh, let's uh, break up your uh, business into the key revenue drivers. One is direct core, roughly 55% of your revenues. That will continue to see above industry growth rates. And secondly, your HP DXC channel, which has been a big growth driver, at least for the last few quarters. And investor concern there is that there perhaps is limited visibility for a double-digit revenue growth beyond F519 for your HP DXC channel. How would you respond to that? Sure, so let me take direct core first, which is kind of the core largest part of our business and most easily comparable to third-party IT services. That business is, actually has had a track record of growing above market for almost four or five years in a row and continues to be above market growth this year. It's been the key driver of our growth, uh, very heavily focused on banking, financial services, insurance. We've added some new engines of growth in terms of verticals. We started to see growth coming out of Europe. So I think it's got multiple engines of growth firing between strategic accounts, Blackstone portfolio, Europe growth, and new logos. Then if we talk about the DXCHP channel, I think uh, the concern is valid because you know that, his, that channel has had a history of tumultuous past, especially you know, from the 2010-11 timeframe. So I understand the concerns that investors have had, analysts have had. But keep in mind, this is a different era. Right? There are four distinct relationships under that one channel. There's DXC, there's HPE, there's HPI, and there's Microfocus. Of course, we are most mature and you know, relatively most mature in DXC because we've actually been in that group the, the longest, the enterprise services division that used to be with HP. But even there, we are only 1% of their overall revenue. Right? So the runway for growth is, is pretty much there. With HPE, HPI, and Microfocus, I think we've just barely scratched the surface because they're all Fortune 500 companies. Our wallet share there is very low, you know, actually extremely low single digits. So I do believe that there's a long opportunity for us to continue to execute across that channel and continue to make sure that the channel, at least for the foreseeable future, stays at or above market growth. Okay. These two businesses roughly contribute 80%, and they are growth additive in your words. Yes. Uh, the other businesses are a bit growth dilutive. You're talking about digital risk, your products business, as well as the India business. Correct. Uh, share the outlook on these three. So I think uh, digital risk is an interesting case of uh, transformation underway. We uh, we had a pretty dire situation in that business about a year and a half ago. Obviously, the, the macro environment in the U.S. is still headwinded because we actually work on servicing mortgage origination and refinances. Uh, because of the interest rate environment in the U.S., that business is, you know, is very headwinded. But we're very glad that we've actually managed to get into near adjacencies, cross-sell IT services from emphasis into those clients, and really stabilized and actually marginally grown the top line in the last four quarters. So we guided to a 28 30 to 38 million dollar revenue range there. We are above that range. We feel good about that. But the other important thing is that while we've done that, we've also transformed the profitability profile of that business. Mm -hmm. It went from being mid single digits, actually it was trending downwards. We've now brought it to healthy double digits. Uh, high single digit revenue as well as double digit margin kind of a guidance yeah, for I digital think we, risk? Yeah, I would say mid to high single digit revenue and continue to ex you know, execute on the cross sell opportunity. Uh, let me come to your margins. Last year, your margin guidance band was 14 to 16%. You upped it to 15 to 17%. Now there is a currency tailwind which will benefit your margins in the coming year. 
Are margins trending upwards? Yeah, I think our long-term you know, aspirational goal is for the company is uh, continue to grow our market and have a continuous improvement in operating margin profile. And that's what we're executing on, as you see this year, is all about you know, consistent growth. And as we do that, can we continue to find ways to expand our, our operating margin? And that's kind of the, the guidance we have. We are trending towards the upper end of the current year range of 15 to 17. We're still keeping some gunpowder dry to continue to invest in the business. So we are not changing the range yet. But we feel good about the way we're executing on the margin levers, especially things like pyramid optimization, fixed price, you know, pricing environment, right shoring. Uh, the other potential growth driver can be the Blackstone portfolio. Um, give us a sense of the kind of opportunity that you're looking to target from the Black uh, from the Blackstone portfolio group of companies. So I think it's a I would say another long-term opportunity. We just scratched the surface with the you know the first few deals last year. Uh, can we continue that run rate? Can we find ways to make this a meaningful portion of our revenue? within direct core, the answer is yes. Uh, it's really all about how we execute because this does require a lot of execution because there are lots and lots of companies that we actually end up talking to. Yes, uh, but give us a sense of the kind of opportunity it may be. You were telling me Yeah, I think it's a billion and a half to two billion annual IT spend. Yeah. Question and is, you're the only IT company in the Blackstone In portfolio. the portfolio, but again, yeah. you know, these companies operate on a federated manner, so they do work with a lot of our competitors. If I can look at the billion and a half to two billion annual spend, question really is, can we get to a 10%, 15%? Uh, again, sky is the limit, yeah. but really, you know, let's first get to double digits. We are still very, very low single digits right now. Any acquisitions and any plans to increase the dividend payout ratio from the current 50%? Yeah, I think, uh, again, dividend payout is probably going to be consistent. Uh, the reason we're using buyback is kind of a one-time return back to shareholders. It's probably a more efficient way to do it, uh, and it, it's probably more case-by-case. Uh, -case. Acquisition uh, plans are very much, uh, you know, on the table. We've looked at three vectors of acquisitions, capability, uh, at adding to our verticals or subverticals and adding to our geographic mix. And as we speak, you know, we're fairly actively engaged on all three vectors to identify, you know, what the right fit is. Uh, even after the buyback and the dividend, we still think we have enough gunpowder drive to kind of continue to execute our plans on, on M&A. Hopefully, you know, um, you know, FI19, we should be able to see something happen. But again, you know, these things, when they happen, they happen. Okay. Uh, and how big could the acquisition be? I think uh, typically uh, no more than 10, 15, 20 percent of revenue because that's easy to absorb, easy to, to integrate. That's you still know, 150, 200 million dollars of... Uh, again, that's the upper end of the range I'm saying, you know, because that's the kind of, if you look at our, our uh, cash position, that's the kind of planning we have right now. Okay, so that is emphasis. Let me tell you some things that he's not spoken before that he indicated in the interview. One is the long-term goal of the company is to keep growing above the industry growth rate. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to end at F519. They want to do that even in 20 and 21 thereafter. Secondly is the continuous improvement in the margin trajectory. Last year, they upped the mar this year, they upped the margin uh, band guidance uh, to 15 to 17% versus 14 to 16% last year. And now the company indicates that X of currency, they want to keep improving it because they have mm -hmm. some optimization they have some you know uh, margin uh, you know benefits which could come through from pyramid optimization etc and finally uh, there's perhaps an F that you know we could look to close it in F519 uh, so that is also going to be something very interesting to watch and the stock is reacting you know positively uh, as we speak absolutely Rima. three out of three actually uh, in the, this show itself three IT companies have spoken to us and all three of them it seems that uh, shareholders and retail audience and all our viewers, they like what they're saying. Sacksoft is at the high point of the day. Sonata Software as well is at the high point of the day. And emphasis, that's the big one actually. And there, as Rima says, is they're looking to outpace the industry for the next few years and a possible acquisition as well on the cards. And that stock as well at the high point of the day as we speak. Let's slip into a short break. Uh, when you come back, we'll get you more on the markets as well as stock specific action. Well, India Ratings just released their mid-year outlook a short while ago. My colleague Sapna Das caught up with Devendra Kumar, uh, the chief economist of India Ratings, and began by asking him about the rupee projection going forward. Look, um, as an as a economist, we, uh, we give a view about the, where the currency will be in the entire fiscal year. Uh, we were earlier uh, at uh, close to 66, 67 rupee, but now the way the things are panning out, uh, our estimate now shows for FY19, that is from 1st April 2000, 
18 to 31st March uh, 2019, rupee will average somewhere around 68 rupee 40 paisa. Uh, there are many reasons why it is uh, rupee is behaving the way it is behaving. Uh, it starts from a the general emerging market weakness as we had seen post uh, the crisis in in Turkey. We had seen the same thing happening in um, what happened in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, the your, our, uh, trade flows or capital flows are not as buoyant as they were in last few years. So they, we, we are witnessing a slowness, slowness in that. Uh, because of commodity prices and especially oil, our estimates suggest that we may, we may have a trade uh, goods trade deficit somewhere around around 190 billion dollar uh, uh, dollar for the for the year it's only the services side and full year trade, trade fully, deficit full year trade deficit 190 billion dollar 190 billion dollar uh, it is being saved by by our services exports and the remittances but even taking that into account we are looking at a number which is in excess of 71 billion dollar in the current account translating 2.6% of the GDP as the current account deficit. How much was the trade deficit last financial year? If you could uh, just give us an idea. Last financial year, it was lower, uh, low, lower, and but 90, 190 billion dollar will be by far the, the highest trade deficit we'll be having. Uh, it's mainly emanating from, the, from, from uh, oil and the way the oil prices are behaving. I believe today morning there was somewhere around 71 and a half dollar a barrel but nowhere closer to where, where, where they were um, a year back. And that is putting a putting lot, of, lot of pressure on that. Another news which had most of the people have, may have missed, the Reliance is going to take a shutdown for a particular unit for two, two, two weeks. So you may see further weakness in, in the exports as well as in the, in the uh, enlar um, enlargement of trade deficit. In, in either either in the month of August or in the month of month of September. Welcome back and let's talk about precious metals now which have seen a constant decline. We have seen a bit of a buying come in right now. That's because the US dollar has softened. We have seen the Turkish lira rebound a bit. But even after a bit of a gains that we can see on the screen, it is still on the lower side of the range. You have the gold prices trading at a 19-month lows. Silver prices have broken below $15 per ounce. That's a two-and-a-half-year lows for that. Platinum prices are trading at a 10-year lows and you have palladium trading at a 13-month lows as well. So clearly no safe haven buying coming in here. A bit of a buying that we have seen coming on the screens is purely because the US dollar is reacting and we've seen that impact come in. Dharmesh Bhatia then joins us to talk more about that. Dharmesh, hi. Uh, the precious metals clearly haven't seen buying in 2018. It seems completely written off with the kind of levels we are holding right now. But essentially, in case of silver, where we have seen decline in gold, decline in industrial metals, what is your sense trading below 15? How much lower can we go? Uh, good afternoon. Manisha, I still think that the precious metal has a, a leverage, more leverage on the selling side till now. I, I'm seeing that the short is building up continuously. Fundamentally, there is no buying in the market, especially if you are talking about uh, silver, which is like a 50% bullion and 50% base metal category. The price has not been showing that kind of return. So the negative return has keep on in increasing. And if you see the rare rate, like the, the difference between the U.S. Treasury and the interest rate is keep on creeping up. The more the rare rate goes up, the more the precious metal will get hammered. So I'm expecting the silver to go way below 14 also. It almost touched 14, 30 levels. Mm. But technically, the market still has the potential to, to go further down. With rupee concern, the domestic market has not seen that kind of a fall or else the price would have reached 32 to 33,000 rupees. So the potential is still there to go short. I'm expecting the weakness will continue further. And what's your sense on gold prices now? Because we've broken below 1,200, we've broken below 1,180. Are you looking at levels of 1,150, 1,130 now? Because that is the next that seems on chart. So technically, it can go triple digit also. I'm still bearish <laughs> on the gold price. Uh, there is no fundamental uh, buying in the market. And if you yeah. see the interest rate is creeping up and equity market is outperforming, and until there is geopolitical tension, there is no buying interest in the gold. And the price has not reached 1360 for past almost three years. It touched, and that again is shown a sell-off. Uh, I'm expecting market to touch 1150, 1140, which is a Trump rally. That time, the market had touched that level, so you can expect gold heading that for a short momentum. Domestic market, again, you can see the price 300, 400 rupees, little par because of uh, the rupee getting depreciated. Hmm. 
Okay. Point. All right. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Dharmesh, as well as Manisha. Well, uh, keep an eye on the index. We're trading mildly in the red, but keep in mind the PSU banking index has some positive commentary that's coming out. Uh, banking secretary on some wires, in fact, is saying that the worst is behind for PSU banking stocks, and that's why, in fact, you're seeing that that index is up close to 100% percent in an otherwise dull, dull market. We'll uh, wrap up on this show. You stay with us. Business lunch comes up next.